Hello and welcome to this OncLive Peer Exchange, updates in the management of hairy cell leukemia. I'm Dr. Jay Park from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. Joining me today in this virtual discussion are my colleagues, Dr. Stephen Kutre from Stanford University Medical Center, Dr. Fahad Rabandi Kushani from MD Anderson Cancer Center, Dr. Alan Saban from Scripps Health, and Dr. Andrea Sittlinger from Duke University Cancer Institute. So hair cell leukemia is a rare, slow-growing cancer of the blood involving excess abnormal B cells. Today, we're going to discuss a number of topics pertaining to the management and practical application of the most recent data on the disease. So let's get started on the first topic. Can you start us off by providing some overview of the hair cell leukemia epidemiology, some of the risk factors, and perhaps clinical presentations? Okay, good morning. Um, Herisa leukemia is a relatively uncommon uh, hematologic malignancy. Uh, they're said to be at about 600 to 800 cases annually in the US. I think that's an underestimate. Uh, I think that was before the introduction of flow cytometry, where now it's easier to detect uh, Herisa leukemia circulating in the peripheral blood. It's generally a disease of males um, rather than females. The ratio is about four to one. Uh, usually middle-aged patients, um, but there's great uh, variability. The youngest patient I've seen is 26, and I've seen the disease in 90-year-olds. Uh, it's mostly a disease of Caucasians. Uh, why it doesn't affect et other ethnic groups to the same degree, I'm uncertain, but it certainly occurs in um, Hispanics. Uh, of these 800 patients I've seen, probably only one has been African-American, and I've seen a handful of Asian uh, Americans with this disorder. Uh, what predisposes patients to this disorder? No one really knows. Um, there's various theories about pesticides, organic solvents, uh, but I don't think uh, they've been definitively proven. Uh, amongst the Caucasians, there's a higher incidence amongst uh, Ashkenazi Jews. Uh, the reason for that is unclear. Um, it is a disorder of the memory preplasma cell, and the circulating uh, lymphocytes can accumulate in the spleen, and less commonly in lymphocytes in the bone marrow, and hence the clinical presentation of splenomegaly, uh, cytopenias, uh, monocytopenia is a hallmark of untreated hairy cell leukemia. Um, this is a disease with a very indolent and protracted clinical course, usually, and we'll get into the various factors uh, associated with it. Yeah, I think uh, sometimes we see, in, I have seen very young patients with a hair cell leukemia. It is a disease of relatively younger patients compared to other blood cancers that we may see with leukemias. Do you guys, any of you guys have any thoughts about, and I have seen some patients in tw their 20s and 30s, which are very rare. Uh, but any differences in terms of the clinical, I mean, so, not so much the presentations, uh, but in terms of the prognosis, any other factors to consider for this uh, younger patients? Uh, when it occurs in younger patients, uh, I had a paper in blood some years ago, it tends to be somewhat more aggressive. Uh, so the prognosis in younger people isn't as good as in older people, but older patients can also die of unrelated causes. Uh, so it's probably a little bit more biologically active in younger patients. Um, I've very rarely seen patients in their 20s. Uh, the youngest patient I've ever seen is 26, and I'm not sure it occurs in childhood. Uh, Dr. Sittlinger, uh, what are some of the laboratory findings um, that these patients, or how did they usually diagnose the hairy cell usually come about? Um... Absolutely. So similar to other kind of indolent lymphoproliferative disorders, there's kind of three big buckets of patient, how patients um, are found to have this. One is that they present to their primary care doctor and have labs drawn for whatever reason, screening and otherwise, and are found to have significant cytopenias. Um, about 60 to 80% of people are found to have pancytopenia um, and neutropenia particularly, as well as monocytopenia. They're both in the range of 80% um, of patients will be found to have this disorder. So they will often present to us because they were found to have these um, lab abnormalities. 
I will say there, while neutropenia and pancytopenia is by far the predominant um, lab abnormality, there are about 10% of patients that present with a leukocytosis, and these tend to be the more aggressive um, and maybe even variant hairy cell uh, leukemia patients, which we'll talk about more later. But um, I just want to alert for the general practitioner or, or a general um, oncologist that just because you're seeing a, leuc a leukocytosis doesn't rule out hairy cell. Um, and then the, one of the very profound features would be splenomegaly. So up to 90% or more of patients have splenomegaly, and, and some patients can present with profound even um, splenic rupture just with how big their spleen is. Um, that's less common now with imaging and everything else, but that has been a problem in the past. And what's interesting with hairy cell compared to other um, leukemias and lymphomas are it's much less common to have lymph nodes involved as well. So pure splenomegaly is a, a clue that you that hairy cell is in the differential among other things as well. And then finally, um, people also present with systemic complaints. It's usually fatigue, weakness, um, sometimes weight loss, particularly the, a large spleen with causing early satiety and people are not eating as well. They also can present with um, profound thrombocytopenia leading to bleeding. Um, so some of these patients, will, you will see with that. And then the other thing is there are either infections or recurrent infections or recurrent you know, autoimmune complications that will also alert um, patients. What's, other, what's another thing that's interesting with hairy cell compared to other leukemia and lymphomas is it's not as common to have fevers and night sweats um, with hairy cell. Usually, if I see a patient with fever or night sweats, I'm either starting to think maybe something else is going on or just the infections that come along um, with these patients since they're immunocompromised. But those are kind of the three, when I talk to patients, those are kind of the three main presentations that we see initially that alerts us to that hairy cell diagnosis. Uh, Andrea, I've, um, just anecdotally, the, you know, the uncommon patient who presents with the leukocytosis, yeah. I've been impressed that they often have extremely high fevers. That's a good point. It's that unusual, it's a, it's a definitely a different um, phenotype. Yeah, absolutely. I also wanted to mention that uh, the, the situation of massive splenomegaly and uh, significant constitutional symptoms is becoming less and less common, mainly because yeah. uh, people are getting routine uh, blood screening. So uh, actually quite frequently these days, uh, patients are found to be slightly cytopenic on a routine uh, blood evaluation and, and further workup shows uh, hairy cell leukemia. And uh, there are unusual presentations, as you mentioned, lymphadenopathy is not that common, but you know, I've certainly had patients uh, with very unusual presentations. I had a young lady who had a paravertebral mass, which turned out to be hairy cell leukemia. I had another gentleman who had a renal mass and they resected it thinking is renal cell carcinoma. It turned out to be hairy cell leukemia. And I had another gentleman who was managed by orthopedics for almost a year because of back pain and severe bone pains and eventually he had a blood count and he had massive involvement of all of his uh, skeleton with hairy cell leukemia. So unusual presentations do exist. Absolutely. I think, um, especially when you're seeing a lot of hairy cell, you're going to see a lot of the un unusual and uncommon variants. Um, so I think that's an excellent point. It, just, it, is, it, it is interesting. And certainly, I mean, the vasculitis and some of the all those autoimmune manifestations that go with it as well can present in those other organ manifestations. So there's certainly a lot of different ways, um, but I think it's interesting to highlight that a lot of, of the majority of patients that sometimes you will see less of some of the other common things like lymphadenopathy in these patients. And, all, yeah, and, and I am so, I think it is so fortunate that we are catching these patients a lot earlier and we're not having the massive splenomegaly and, and splenic ruptures that, that used to be seen. 